Right, so focusing on how to build it right. Um, this is basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to like put a rocket into space and we're trying to do so with a large group of people who are all like really happy and on the same team and just like loving life. Um, this, is, this is what we're not trying to do. <laughs> Although some days it sort of feels like we're, we're, in, <laughs> we're in this spot. Uh, I'm sure you guys can identify with me if you've ever ran production software. Uh, but this highlights like one of our first principles at, at Chain, and that is, uh, it's, this is an old African proverb that like I really cling to, especially because you know I've been in a lot of different engineering environments where you you might be like assigned to a project, or you might own a code base, or you like own part of the system, and like you kind of feel trapped sometimes, like especially like if it starts like getting under load and like it has bugs and like you are the pager for it. Like that can be kind of just like a really bad spot to be in. You begin to hate your life and you don't enjoy the product that much. And then that like comes through in the actual product. Like it doesn't work that well. And so with that in mind, one of the things that we think about uh, very critically as like an engineering organization is that everything we do should enable all of us to work on the system. Like there should be no like single point of failure. There should be no burnout, no silos. And so we kind of like work that back into, you know, just like, a, and these aren't rules necessarily, this is just kind of like, you know, process is such a dirty word. Like you hear people like talking about process in their engineering organization. And the way that I think about process is more of just like, what are we doing that's working? And let's just write that down. And that's kind of like what we define as process. So an example, when we're talking about like software, we don't say like his code or her code. We, you know, like, and that can be very tempting sometimes. You'll be like, oh man, like, there's that bug in her code and like it's really kind of affecting my system. But that like kind of reinforces this whole like silo stereotype. So we try and just refer to it as the code or like the system wasn't working as well as we thought it was or something like that. Um, collaborative design sessions. So ideally like nobody designs a system. Like we don't really have or want heroes on the team. Like we want it to be kind of like a group effort that makes decisions that are going to be wise to the group over the, the next few years. And sometimes that involves pair programming. Uh, not all the time, it's not like a rule or anything, but oftentimes like, we'll be so excited about a design that we just like, built that we're like, oh, let's work on this together. And so we want to enable that. Um, but the important thing here is that even if you don't do, it, do pair programming, everything gets reviewed. There isn't a single line of code that we put into production that like, doesn't get a thumbs up or an LGTM, um, and, which is an uh, acronym for looks good to me. Um, but, but everything gets reviewed. Uh, and, and this last point is kind of weird, especially because like, if you've worked on a larger team, you know that this starts to like, break down. Uh, but today, we're a smaller team and we get to enjoy this. And that is everybody on the teams does operations. Like we all do security, we all do data structure design. And we hire, we hire for those roles, right? When, when, when we're looking at people to join our team, we kind of like, you know, understand like, okay, do they have these types of the backgrounds? They might not be specialized in any one area, um, but we want them to have kind of like a T-shape where it's like they can cover like that broad spectrum and maybe they go deep on one particular issue. Um, and, and that kind of helps us like by building that type of team, that kind of helps us, you know, be in a position where, where everybody can, can contribute and be on the same page. Um, and, and, and this is another thing that we like to say around here. Um, and, and that is just to kind of reinforce this principle. And, and uh, you know, we, we kind of stick by this because we've, we've done it wrong a lot in the past where we've just said, okay, let's just quickly go out and build something. Uh, but but when, you, when you build a platform, when you build an API that people are, like that developers are dependent upon, like the slightest little change that you make uh, in, 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 in your API or in your design decision, that, that will have effects for years. Uh, because generally, like we don't like to change our software, right? And so when we write something that, like, ed, that uses an API, whether it's like a Postgres API or a chain API or like your, your, your programming language, like once you've written that piece of code and it works, you don't want to come back to it again, right? Like you kind of have put that problem away. And so this we find like really critical in the way that we build our systems because we might introduce bugs into the way that an API is implemented. Like maybe it's not intended to be that way, but there's a bug there. And so now everybody has built their software on top of that bug. And so we might not even be able to fix the bug because if we fix the bug, it might break the interface, which would cause a bunch of people to have to go rebuild their code, which is like completely unacceptable. So we, we place an incredible amount of value on just the upfront design. Um, and, and again, like 
the, th this kind of works like, you know, this, this process that I'm kind of describing to you is kind of like for our company and our position. And we weren't always in this position and we won't always be in this position. And so for instance, like when you have, uh, when you have an MVP, when you have like an idea and you're not really sure if it's going to work, like you don't have any customers, you don't have any users, you, you might have like four or five, but you don't have like a lot of them. And you're not really certain what's going to happen. You haven't gotten uh, venture capital or you haven't gotten revenue yet you probably don't want to invest in a lot of like upfront process. Like you don't want to like engineer for high availability or for scalability. Like if you, if your app does one request per second, that's probably okay. You know, like it could probably do like half that, like maybe it does 30 requests per minute or something like that's, that's probably fine. Um, but we've kind of chain has been kind of, uh, we were in that position at one time, like in, in, in our first week of operations, like our product, what, like it wasn't that great. Um, and so we're growing out of that though, like as pe more people depend on us and as we've solidified kind of like who we are and, and where we want to go, uh, we realize that like there, there has to be like a growing up there. And so that's kind of changed the way that we've thought about how we engineer, uh, the products that we, that we put into production. Um, and so the way that we like to think about it is like when we're building something, uh, our first, like our first mission is to retire the problem. And so, for instance, like with notifications, we've actually built notifications three times. Uh, the first time that we built it was like back in like day one of the company when we were like, okay, let's just like put something together and see if it works. And like there's a couple of people who have asked for it. Let's just like throw something together and see if they like it. Uh, when we did that, it turns out the product wasn't quite right. The way that we built the product, it was like hard to use and hard to understand. And so we realized like, oh gosh, like we have to like rebuild it and like rethink about the product. So we did that. And then we rebranded it. It was called webhooks and we, we rebuilt it and we called it notifications and we got the product right. And people were like, Oh, it works great. You know, it's like, it's easy to use. And like, uh, I, I was able to set it up in no time. Uh, and then like uh, a couple of months later, they're like, Oh man, it's like really slow. Like, you know, like what's up with that? Like it's it, the latencies aren't where we need to be. And so we're like, okay, like we got the, you know, we got the product right and now we need to get the engineering right. And so we spent a lot of time and, and I, at the, towards the end, I'm going to give you like an uh, an overview of the architecture of how notifications works today. Uh, which is something that we're very proud of. Uh, but but it, it took us a while to get to that point where we had like the product right and we had the engineering right. And it was at that moment that we realized like, okay, like the stage where our company is at now, like we can't afford to do that cycle again. Like that, ci that cycle took way too long and uh, you, you only have so much goodwill with people who are using your product or your platform. And so the way that we think about things today is that like when we go to build something, so there's going to be something that comes after notifications and I can't tell you what it is right now, but there's going to be something that comes next. And the way that we think about engineering that thing that comes next is that we have to retire the problem. Like we want to get the product right and we want to get the engineering right. And we like, once we build that software, we don't want to think about it for a while, not forever. Like we'll have to rethink it eventually, but not for like two years, hopefully. Uh, so like, or maybe even one year, I don't know. So we, we think about how it's going to scale in the, in the medium term. Um, and the third one is like my favorite. It isn't an operational burden. Uh, wearing a pager is like, it can be a very like bad experience for like your life as a human being. Uh, like not being able to like, you know, go to a yoga class or to like take a shower, being afraid that the platform's going to go down like <laughs> while you're bathing. Like that is an awful place to be in. Uh, so, like the, the thing that we think about like most often with our platform is like, how can we design this thing so that it's not going to be like paging me all the time. Um, and there's a lot of tricks that, that, that you can, that you can employ there. The, 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 the number one trick is just make it like so simple that it couldn't possibly fail. Like when, when you start adding a bunch of things to your system, like every moving part has like a huge cost. Every abstraction has like an enormous cost that, and again, this is me speaking from experience. I don't have any uh, rigorous academic, uh, explanation as to why, but um, just over the years. Uh, and, and then uh, again, to reiterate, like it's, it's understandable by the team, you know, it's like one person doesn't have all that knowledge loaded into their brain. Um, and again, like to reiterate, like we, we have like a real aversion to rewriting software at this stage. Like, you know, it's something that we definitely don't want to do. Um, and, and this is something worth pointing out actually, is that like our, everybody on the team has like a real fascination towards simplicity. And, uh, I, are you guys familiar with Rich Hickey? Raise your hand if you know who Rich, Rich Hickey is. Uh, a couple of people. Okay, so if you're writing software, I, like Rich, like he has some like pretty wild opinions, and like I don't agree with all of them, but like you have to check out some of his stuff because he writes all sorts of really great. Uh, uh, let me put it another way. How many of you heard, heard of Closure, the language? 
Okay, so he was a creator of Clojure. So he's got like some intuition around like how software works. And he's a pretty smart guy. Uh, but he has this great talk called Simple Made Easy. And he highlights the difference between simple and easy. And oftentimes you'll hear people use the words interchangeably. But what like I found over the years, and, and this has been kind of like more painfully true in the last couple of years, is that the two are like so far apart. And oftentimes, easy is not simple. Like, usually easy is the more complex solution. Like, when you gem install something or you just pip install something into your system, you're bringing in a lot of complexity that, like, in the beginning, like, it was easy. Like, I was able to solve my problem really easily just by bringing in this, this external dependency. But it's when, like, that external dependency that you don't know exactly how it works, when it misbehaves at, like, 3 a.m. and, like, you have, like, all of these, like, awful latencies and, like, you know, your service is crashing, like, that's when you, like, think to yourself, like, oh, God, like, what have I done? You know, like, I brought in this thing into my house that I didn't even, like, know what it was and now it's, you know, like, barfing all over my carpet. Um, so, <laughs> like, it's, it's something, like, it's something that we think about a lot. Um, and then again, like the, the age old, you know, wisdom of Yagni, you know, like, sure, when you're writing the code, you're tempted to be like, oh, and if like, and if I add this abstraction, or if I, if I make this method signature, take this like, interesting set of like, arguments, like, then it'll be future proof, then like six months from now, when we do all these things, like, it's gonna be so easy. And the spoiler alert there is like, uh, six months from now, you're not going to be doing those things, and it's also going to be really hard to remove that code. So it's there's a lot of like there's a lot of pain that you can avoid by just saying like okay like what's the bare minimum that we can do today that will get us like that will get the product out the door. And so we think about that all the time, and it's something that is very hard. Like we'll never be good at it, like, and it takes a team of people to challenge you and to say like do you really need that? You know like are you sure that's the method that you know we need to be using? And, it, and it's not, it's not, we're not blaming, you know, it's just like, we're just trying to like evolve the system to that place. Um, and then, yeah, abstractions are really hard to get right. So again, like it's, it's so, like I, I'm, I'm kind of down on abstractions in general. Like MVC, I'm not even convinced that's a good idea. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Uh, and then databases, like databases kind of almost by definition are like the biggest source of complexity. And that's something that like is particularly interesting to blockchain technology uh, because we have databases and like we have this distributed database and we're trying to do interesting things with it. And so when you think about like even like simple open source projects like Toshi uh, where you have like uh, you have this notion of like okay we have like a Bitcoin node and then we have like a Postgres database and then we're going to synchronize the two and then we're going to query the Postgres database. Like that is like super complex right there. You're, you're talking about synchronizing two databases and there's, there's all sorts of like really interesting race conditions, data races, like around like propagating uh, transactions to the network and making sure that you also update your unspents, uh, your, your unspent index so that you, you know, when you want to go create a new transaction in short order that your unspents accurately reflect the transaction that was just propagated. Uh, there's all sorts of like really interesting engineering challenges that you have to pay attention to uh, just by adding another database. Uh, so, it, it, in general, like, we don't like to have databases. In fact, we try to only have one, uh, and we would like to get rid of that too, but I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Um, so if you've got any ideas, uh, we, we can talk about that later too. Um, so kind of some examples here. So uh, specifically speaking to the, the database part, um, so our notifications, we deliver them by HTTP or we do WebSockets. And they're two separate code bases. And roughly, if you counted the number of lines of, and they basically do the same thing. Like, the systems are so similar. Like, if you squinted, they'd be identical in terms of, like, what they do. Uh, but the WebSocket implementation has, like, a third of the code. And so the other two-thirds of the code is all about state management. It's about, like, writing stuff to a database and making sure that, like, if the process restarts, we can do recovery and we can load all of the data back into memory. And so this kind of highlights the, the, the cost of what, what a database adds to um, to, to a, a program. Um, and then not persisting new transactions, single processes. So we don't have a lot of queues. In fact, we don't use any queues at all, any like queuing services. Like we don't have Rabbit, like we don't uh, use FQS for notifications. Like we, we, we don't do any of that. We, tr we try and keep them things in, in, in single processes uh, just because that reduces like the amount of places that we have to go debug latency problems. And, and obviously the, the common argument there is like, well, you know, what about like availability? And, and, and to that, we, we choose to solve that in, in other ways. We, we have two single processes that are able to work together to accomplish what we need in terms of availability. Um, 
So an another thing that's really helped us with simplicity is we build with Go. Uh, and and one, of like, one of my favorite things about Go programs is that when you compile them, you get a static binary, and it's pretty small. And so what this means is that like, our, our EC2 instances that we deploy to can be very simple. Like We don't need Chef. We don't need configuration management. Because all we're doing is getting a Linux instance, and then we like, put a Go program on it. And we just start that Go program with Upstart, which is included in Ubuntu. Um, and th there's, you know, there, obviously, there's some more details to talk, talk about there. But the point is, like, we don't have to deal with a lot of the operational overhead of all these, you know, co these complex systems like Chef and Docker and stuff like this, because we keep our, we keep our, our, our programs like, really simple by definition. And we just punt on, <coughs> on solving any of those problems. Uh, so I kind of talked about this earlier, but you know, like, all this stuff is going to change. You know, six months from now, we might have completely different views. So don't hold us to them. Um, this is like nitty gritty, like if, if, if we were going to like, you know, once we have the documentation, this is like how we go about like building software. And I think the most important thing on this slide is number one, uh, think about the problem. Uh, it's like my favorite thing to do in this office is to like, after we've talked about like a new product that we're going to build, is to watch like Keith or Jeff just like walk around the office, like with like a ping pong ball and they're just like staring, just like walking around. Like, that's like the best thing ever because that means they're thinking about the problem. And that's something that like, it's so hard to do because we have all these tools in front of us and we're always like, oh, like I wanna write the code. Uh, but it's like, it's incredibly empowering to be able just to know like, just to have the space where it's like, okay, like I'm gonna go for uh, three or four hours and all I'm gonna do is just think about the problem and like really get my head into it and really understand it. And then like, you know, you have a piece of paper where you're sketching out ideas, but like you're free of the computer. Like you can, you can solve the problem for just the problem's sake. Uh, that's like engineering Xanadu for me. Uh, so we do that a lot. Uh, we use these whiteboards, we erased them because we had all sorts of really secret stuff on there, but we use these whiteboards a lot that are all over the place to, to, to kind of draw out what the solution looks like with boxes. And we like to write boxes because if you have more than one box, you can debate it. Like, well, why do you have two boxes? You should only have one box. That's what we say a lot. Um, after that, we write some code. We get somebody to review the code. We iterate on the feedback. So somebody says, like, oh, that method name is like, way too long. Like, it's too hard to type. Like, I, it hurts my hands. So like, make it shorter. Um, we push on to master. Uh, and we only push on to master if somebody gives it the thumbs up. So every piece of code gets reviewed. Uh, we, we always, uh, we then deploy to staging, and we always deploy from master. We don't deploy from feature branches. And then once we're good on staging, we deploy to production. And then uh, number nine is like by far the hardest, but it's just after, after the code's been written, we have to debug and maintain it for the next three years. Uh, so this is like an example, like this is what all of our, we use GitHub for pull requests uh, for code review, uh, which like GitHub, like it, it's, it's all right. It definitely has some, some issues, but we like it. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best cloud service that we found so far. Um, basically, somebody will open up a pull request, they'll describe what it is, that's, that's the commit message right there. Uh, somebody will say, please take a look. And all this goes into our Slack channel, so we're always kind of like keeping our eye out, looking for new pull requests. Uh, you know, there'll be some notes here, and then there's the look good, looks good to me, and, and, and that, that wraps it up. Uh, our commit history. So one of the things that we don't do is th th there's usually like a big green button here that says merge pull requests. We don't use that. Uh, we, we, we always rebase because we like to have like our commit history just be like this clean, beautiful story of how the program's evolving. And we also squash our commits. So like on a pull request, you might get feedback and you might be typing like, oh, you know, fix up or like change name. Uh, we squash all that down into one commit and then we put it on top of master. So that way our, our, our master branch just has this clean, nice story of, of what's going on in the system. Uh, okay, so this is uh, ch completely changing the topic here. This has to deal with the, uh, the uh, maintain for three years uh, uh, side of things, and that is dashboards. We use a lot of dashboards and we instrument everything. Uh, what we do, uh, so like I said, we build a lot of our systems in Go, and we use the, the metrics uh, package for Go. Uh, metrics is, is, is kind of a, a library that's been made famous by a lot of uh, uh, Java developers. Um, there was the Code of Hell metrics package that uh, a lot of people use, and, and uh, Code of Hell actually wrote uh, a similar package for Go, so we use that. So in our process, we're, we're, we're building histograms, we're building counters, we're building gauges, and then those get aggregated in memory, and then every 10 seconds, it gets snapshotted and goes to Librato. 
Uh, so the idea there is that we just, you know, we don't really use stats D or anything like that because we'd like not to have to just flood our network with a bunch of metrics that are going around. We'd rather just, because Go, has, Go is great at concurrency and parallelism, we'd rather just uh, you know, do some work inside of our process and instead of like dumping 10,000 things to the network, just dump like 10 things every 10 seconds. Um, so we do that. Uh, so we, we, we pay very close attention uh, to like our end-to-end -end latency on notifications. And so you can see here that like in the 99.9 .9 percentile case, the, the, the three nines case, uh, it takes us about 500 milliseconds by the t uh, from when we see a, tr uh, a transaction hash on the network. So when, when we discover something's in the mempool to the time that we can deliver that data to your server. Uh, and then our median case is uh, like 100 milliseconds. Um, and, and, and we generally, like this is kind of like where we like to be. Obviously like we'd like to bring that, that top end number. Like the difference between our 99 and our, and our 999 is, is pretty good. Like we're, we're 200 milliseconds there. Um, but this is the neighborhood that like we're comfortable being in right now. Um, and, and, and then for uh, inbound requests, we usually try and keep our 99th percentile times uh, less than 200 milliseconds. Um, we're not there all the time, as you'll find out, but it's, it's something that we, we shoot for. Uh, we're all on call. Um, basically, the entire company is on call. Uh, we have engineering on call and we have communications on call. And so uh, what happens when you're on call? So we, we, we go on call for one week. Uh, and during that time, you have basically like three items that you need to take care of. Number one is you need to keep the platform online. Uh, number two is you need to deal with like technical customer requests. So if there's like a support ticket that needs like a particularly technical answer, like you have to deal with that. And the, the third thing that you do when you're on call, and this is the most important thing, is you make the, you make the system better than the way you found it. Uh, so we give people the opportunity to kind of boy scout uh, the, the, the system by, you know, just like, oh, like when I came in here, there was this weird thing that was happening and like, I, you know, I, I don't have to worry about the product right now, I'm on call, so I'm going to fix that and I'm going to make that pager stop being noisy, et cetera. Um, and then we, we also have uh, Devin and Charlie uh, who, who are on our product team, they participate in the communication side of on call. So nothing is more, nothing is worse than like 3 a.m. You get a page because something's down, and like you're like in the dark by yourself, like trying to fix it, and like you're worried about customers and stuff like that. So the, we've designed our on-call system so that when something goes wrong, you have a partner, you have like a buddy who like is going to come on with you, and you guys can collaborate, and you, and and the comms person can say like, okay, you know, keep up the good work, like I'm here, I'm right here with you, you know, I'm going to deal with the customer requests, and you just focus on getting the platform back online. Uh, so we found that to be uh, a, a great thing for, for the experience of being on call. Um, yeah, and this is kind of, so we don't page on latencies. We only, pay, so we built these programs called Canaries, and these Canaries just operate on our API. So they're always sending an API request. They're simulating what cu customers are, are going to do, and they run our production API. So these Canaries are always running, hitting our services. And if, they, we, if, if we ever see them deviate from what we expect them to do, then we page on that. And that's the only thing we really page on. We don't page on like disks being full or like running out of memory because all that like doesn't need to wake us up. Like the only thing that needs to wake us up is if we think we're having customer problems. And we use a great service called RunScope uh, to, to, to kind of manage the integration between our Canary programs and PagerDuty. So we use PagerDuty, we use RunScope. Those are great products. You should check them out. Um, cool. Uh, so the infrastructure, so like what we're actually like building on top of, our basic like philosophy or principle here is like the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, and so uh, I, I am like for better or worse, like usually pretty, like I'm naturally uh, apprehensive to like the latest and greatest in DevOps tooling, uh, mostly because like software is just awful to maintain and I don't want to maintain more software than I have to. Um, and so this is like, this is how like we build chain and these are all Amazon components. And so we build on top of EC2 uh, for the most part. There's like a couple things that relates to what's coming next to chain uh, that, uh, that, that don't run here. But for the most part, we run on top of EC2. And our basic thinking here is that we already trust and use Amazon and they have an incredible like engineering and on-call team. And like we want to be using as much of Amazon as we can because we don't plan on going and they're doing a great job. 
And so if, if they offer something that makes our lives easier, we're going to be using it. And so you can see that we're using basically all of <laughs> Uh, AWS here. So uh, requests go through a load balancer. We use auto scaling groups. Um, and so, like, if an instance is misbehaving, like, we're not going to take the time to debug it. We're just going to kill that instance, and a new one's going to come back online and, and hopefully do the right thing. And then we run instances across availability zones as well and in different regions. Um, so, this is like one piece of software that we use uh, to build our AMIs. Um, and do I need to type? Okay, so uh, basically we run stock Ubuntu images. Uh, and because we're deploying Go, we don't have to write any sort of like, uh, we don't have to have any sort of runtime components on there. We basically statically compile uh, a Go binary, we put it in S3, and when the Amazon instance comes online, uh, it just downloads that, 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 that binary, and we configure upstart, and we tell it to run that binary. Uh, so there's no other software. I, I literally think like if it, you can go to this repo, if you look at how like we initialize a machine, we just run sudo apt-get upgrade. <laughs> so we make sure that like we were running the latest uh, you know patch levels for all of the, the the kernel and like our syslog and stuff like that. You know the, the, the software that comes stuck on stuck on the machine, but we don't do anything outside of that. Um, so how, how like how we build and deploy our apps? Uh, so we use Slack a lot, and we have this program called Chainbot, and I love Chainbot. Uh, because Chainbot allows us to do all of our building and deploying uh, right from Slack. So we don't have to like SSH in, we don't have to use our command line, uh, we, we can do all of our deploys from Slack. Um, and basically what happens is like, do I have a demo here? Yeah, okay, so this is, this is what it looks like to deploy. It's a GIF. Um, but I typed the build command and, and what happened was Chainbot went, and went to GitHub, downloaded it, and then now I'm saying deploy that thing to staging. And so it's like going into the ELB and it was uh, uh, basically figuring out which instances that we needed to deploy. And, 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 and uh, it went into those instances and instructed you know, a deploy command. So it, that, that's what build looks like. And basically what's happening underneath the hood is, uh, yeah, so this program is going to GitHub, it's downloading the latest source code, it does the compilation step here and it puts all of that data into an S3 bucket. So we basically have an S3 bucket that indexes all of our, uh, all of our builds, and, uh, and once we have those builds, uh, then we can, like once we have the static binary, which is the, the result of a build command, then we can say, okay, release that, and so it figures out, like, okay, I'm gonna copy the latest build, and I'm gonna combine it with some environment variables which contain, like, database secrets, et cetera, um, which is stored uh, in, in an encrypted S3 bucket, um, and then it combines that to build a new release, and then it puts that into Amazon, and then Chainbot basically dials in to the autoscaling group or the ELB and says, okay, what, all the, what are all the instances in this autoscaling group? And it instructs each one of those instances to basically curl that tarball down, and then to run like a 10-line bash program that like basically cycles uh, the, uh, the, the upstart config and restarts the process. And what's important to note is that we do all of this serially uh, and, and, and not parallel uh, because it allows us to uh, do c zero downtime deploys. So it's like the first thing that we, like if we have four instances in an ELB or in an autoscaling group, we basically go to the first instance, we say, okay, remove yourself and finish your work, then like we cycle that service and when it comes back online, then Chainbot goes to the next instance and it just does that, um, it does that serially so we don't have to worry about deploying, you know, we deploy whenever we want and as often as we want and we don't impact our customers. Um, yeah, so that was the demo there. Uh, and so this is like, this is, and this comes back to like simplicity. Like, no, we can't do everything that Docker does. And like, no, we don't have like all of these wonderful chef scripts that like do all these weird things that I'm not even sure you want. But we, we, we had to write a little bit of code to do exactly what we want. And, and we have like the simplest thing that, that works for us. And we, I, it's like 600 lines of code. So at the end of the day, it wasn't that awful for us. Okay, so now moving into like more of like the services that power api.chain.com. This is basically what we have. We have an API, uh, and the API is, is written in Go and it runs on Amazon. And we actually have a legacy API that we're migrating to our new API, new API and it, it was written in Ruby. And I can talk a lot about like, if, 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 if you guys wanna talk about it, I can talk about Ruby and Go and, and, and uh, why we made those decisions. Um, we have a notification system. We have a notifications WebSocket system. We have Link, and, and Link is a system that, uh, that dials into Bitcoin D 
and indexes the blockchain. Like it, it uses like a polling interval right now, and it, and it writes it into a cluster of Postgres databases. Um, and then we have ch chain.com. We have like the, the web property, which is a, it's a Ruby on Rails app. Um, so, so that's kind of the high level services that we, and, and there's some supporting things here or there, but basically this is, these are the things that run uh, api.chain.com. And so I'll quickly just give you an overview of like how notifications works. Again, because this represents like kind of what we've learned and like the best way that we found to operate data systems that, 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 w that work with Bitcoin. Um, so like I said, there's, there's a single HT note process and uh, HT note has available to it a cluster of, of Bitcoin nodes. And these nodes uh, are, are in different availability zones, they're in different regions, they're, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, the only thing that matters here is that HT note has some way to get a list of IP addresses of Bitcoin nodes. But they're not just any Bitcoin nodes. Uh, they're Bitcoin nodes that we own and that we secure and that we maintain. Uh, and and we, we don't run custom versions of Bitcoin. Uh, we, we run a couple different versions, but we run vanilla Bitcoin D. Um, but we treat them as our firewall. Uh, and so the way that we think about this is that, okay, well, if, if we deploy these Bitcoin nodes and, and, and we, do the, you know, we verify the compilation step and, and we maintain the servers that they run on, then any, any data that we get from here to here, we can trust. Uh, and, and so we're behind the firewall in that regard. Uh, so once, so, so, and, and we actually employ a variety of ways of ingesting data from these Bitcoin Ds. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we open up, the, uh, we open up a, a TCP connection uh, to, to these nodes and we use the, the, regular, um, um, the, the regular wire protocol of uh, you know, receiving transactions or blocks that are relayed to us. Uh, we also have uh, uh, intervals in which we ask for the inventory, we ask uh, for the mempool, et cetera. So we're just trying to, like, we're being kind of spammy, but we're trying to get as much data out of those nodes as we possibly can and as quick as we can. Um, and then we also have to, and this is kind of like an anecdote of Bitcoin development that might save some of you guys some uh, time, uh, but the wire protocol, like th there's a command where you can say, uh, give me the data for this transaction. You provide a transaction hash. And the, 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 the node on the other end uh, will reply later and say, okay, here's the data that you asked for. Um, but every now and then you, you might ask for something and it might return saying that the data is not found. And what we found, what we found was that uh, the, the wire protocol only works for data that's in the, in the mempool. It doesn't, so once a transaction is removed from the mempool, you won't get it from the wire protocol. And the only way that you can get transaction data by ID from a Bitcoin node that isn't in the mempool is to use the RPC mechanism. And in hindsight, like it kind of made some sense to us because the wire protocol is more of like a gossip mechanism, isn't really a database uh, per se, whereas the RPC mechanism, you know, kind of dial, it dials into the level DB and returns data that way. But all that to say, we, we, you know, we, we do some tricks to get, make sure that we can get all the data that we possibly can from these Bitcoin nodes. And, uh, and, and okay, and so coming from the other end, so, so, so you've told us, you say, okay, I'm interested in all transactions that involve address A. So we make a note of that here and, and we write that into a Postgres table. And this program is, is always synchronizing that table. And so as we receive data coming in from these Bitcoin nodes, we can match it against the notifications that you're interested, you're interested in. And then we, we spawn uh, a Go routine, uh, a, a concurrency primitive in Go to be able to make that request to your server. Um, and uh, and we, we end up retrying that for seven days. Um, and so what that looks like inside the Go process is that for every notification that we're trying to deliver, we spawn up like a, a thread, a light, a, a, it's a lightweight thread or a Go routine. And that's like your own Go routine that's just like, it's either sleeping or it you know, has an exponential back off algorithm to it, but it's basically just dedicated to trying and, and, and making your delivery. And all that's backed by a Postgres database so that if we ever have to restart this process or this process has to migrate somewhere else, it can just pick back up where it left off and, and continue the, the retry attempts. But that's, that's all I've got. So uh, we can now talk Q and A. Um, if you have questions about uh, engineering or product or any questions at all, uh, we're happy to, to answer them. Yes? Uh, do you enable TX index on your Bitcoin D or do you use your Postgres for the, the question was TX index and do we use it on Bitcoin D? Right. Yeah, we, we absolutely do. Uh, I think that's the only way, 
uh, by, specifying the, by specifying the TX index flag, I think it's the only way that you can get that, that it'll write data into the level database for the transaction yeah, that's data. Right. I thought maybe you were using your own Postgres, but. Ah, no, uh, we're just using TX index. Yep. Yes. Uh, how do you migrate your Postgres database? How do you migrate all of Because you need to sync your software update to the database migration somehow. Uh, you're asking about database migrations in Postgres? Yeah. Uh, or or when, you, when you deploy, sometimes you would need to uh, also upgrade it or migrate the database. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so generally, how do we handle like whatever we need to make schema changes or like data changes to our database during a software deploy? Um, we don't use any software really for like database migrations. Uh, most of the time what we do, like the, the general process is um, let's make a change in our database that is compatible with like v0 of our software and v1 of our software. So we make that change first, then we deploy our, our software and let it run with both. Uh, basically, how can, the challenge is how can, we, how can we modify our database so that it can run with both versions of the software at the same time? So we figure out whatever that is, and we do it, and then we run, the, we run both versions of the software at the same time, and then we eventually phase out the old version of the software, and then we can go back later and kind of clean up any sort of database uh, issues that we have. I will say that Postgres does give us like an incredible <coughs> advantage when it comes to dealing with database migrations, because, and I'm not sure how many of you guys use Postgres, but Postgres has this great thing called transaction DDL. So you can open up a transaction, you can say begin, and you can say create table, or you can say alter table, or you can add an index. Basically, you can do any database migration issue within the context of a transaction. And that is incredibly powerful, because that means that you can, you can mutate different tables and have them all be affected at the same time when you commit that transaction. Uh, you can also roll back if something goes wrong. Um, so Postgres gives us a lot of like, great resources when it comes to doing database migrations, because of the ability to do migrations inside transactions. Yes? How fast is your database growing right now? Um, so that's a great question, actually. Uh, our database is at, like, at nearly 700 gigs. And th th that's actually a bug. Um, that's a vestige of like, some early engineering decisions that we made. And it's not some place that we're like, really excited to be in. Um, and we're actively working on, and, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but like, we think to ourselves a lot, like, what would it look like if we didn't have a database? Now that's not to say like we're not storing data somewhere, but like what if it wasn't just like a Postgres instance or like or even like or a Redox cluster or whatever you know database du jour is? Like what would it look like if like we relied more on the blockchain uh, to, to to store data uh, and and for us to just create index indexes of that data in memory uh, and in real time? So it's 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 something that we're like we're really excited about, and we've built a few prototypes uh, that have like kind of led to our excitement. But it, it's definitely something that I'm not proud to say that we have a large database because large databases suck; they're hard to maintain. <laughs> yes. Can you say anything about Go versus Ruby? Yeah, Go versus Ruby. So, um, to, so for me, like the so let me let me take a step back. My perspective on this particular issue is that one, uh, at Heroku, we had the opportunity to run a lot of Ruby apps, like a million of them. Um, and, uh, and then my, the other thing that kind of affects my perspective on this is uh, being able to write software that I know is going to work and be well reasoned about like years after I've written it. Um, and so the things that, that kind of motivate us to use Go at Chain are, um, one, concurrency. Uh, we, we like to be able to use as many cores as we can um, because we have these Amazon instances that have like 12 CPU cores. And so uh, we like to be able to leverage that. Uh, and you can do so pretty easily with Go. Go has really great support for running on multiple cores. Uh, the, the concurrency primitive that Go has is called a Go routine. Uh, kind of like a coroutine, kind of like a thread. You can, you can create uh, millions of them, like they're, they're, they're pretty cheap, they're just a few K on the stack. Um, and, and so we, 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 we and, and so how that kind of affects our operations is that, and, and how, how it contrasts Ruby uh, is, is one thing that I've always kind of felt painful about Ruby uh, and, and dynamic languages in general um, is that the, or, or languages that have a gill, is that the concurrency model for web servers has never been that great. 
Um, and so typically what you see in like Ruby deployments is like you'll have a web server that needs to run like 12 processes, like 12 Unix processes. And like within each one of those processes, you can run some threads. But the, 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 the thing, the trick there is like you have like a lot of processes and those processes can't really share resources. Like you can't share resources across all those processes. Like for instance, a database connection. Like it'd be nice if I could have like, you know, just like two or three database connections and share them across, you know, a thousand different concurrent operations. Uh, but because, uh, because if, you, if you choose to, to, to scale your web server with Unix processes, that, that privilege is kind of taken away from you. You have to, uh, you have to spin up like a database connection for each process. Um, and, and so that's kind of, that's something that we think about a lot and, and we don't really necessarily have that problem with Go. We're able to share resources across thousands of different Go routines. Um, being able to compile a program is really nice. Uh, we, we really like that and to be able to have a static analysis of our code. Um, let's see, I don't know, Keith, Jeff, do you guys have any thoughts there? You guys are writing a lot of Go code. Uh, Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> if you, I mean, the, there's a lot of, to, to me, the, the question of Go and, and Ruby and trying to decide between the two boils down to a lot of details. Like, you, you listed two or three just now, and there, there's maybe a dozen more, and, and there's trade-offs with each one. Um, for example, uh, another, another one of those details is, is if you're, you know, if you're looking at some code, and you're just, you know, you're reading a couple of lines of code in the middle of a function somewhere, and you see a function being called, or like some symbol being re referred to, like a method being called, and it's x dot y, and it's calling this method. And you want to know, like, well, what is x? Like, where? Like, maybe you sort of know roughly what it is, but you want to know the details, so you want to look up the definition of x. So the question is, well, where was x defined? And that's that's a very easy question to answer in Go because the, every symbol in a file uh, has a, a static, a, a lexical um, place somewhere up above in that file where either it was defined or it was somewhere in the same package that it was defined. So it's, there's, it's very local or else it was imported from another package and the import statement in the file that you're, in the same file that you're looking at tells you exactly where the other packages where X was actually defined. So you can always, there's a very routine mechanical <coughs> process for looking up the definition of any symbol that you encounter. And like, in my experience, doing the equivalent operate, doing the equivalent process in Ruby basically means you have to grab your entire code base and all your dependencies. Because any symbol that you happen to be looking at, you know, X could be defined literally anywhere. Uh, another, uh, another example that comes to mind is dependencies. Uh, Go has a, an exquisite standard library. Uh, we don't go far outside the standard library. Like we bring in a Postgres driver. Uh, so the, as it relates to Bitcoin, there is an incredible Bitcoin uh, tool suite available for Go. It's called uh, BTC Suite uh, by uh, a company called Conformal. Uh, but they put together just a really great set of, of libraries that are well tested, that are well structured uh, for dealing with Bitcoin. Um, so, uh, but by and large, like you don't have to use a lot of dependencies. Like the standard library, like has a great web server. It has like logging. It has like it's all kind of there, and, and, and it's all input, like uh, uh, contrasted to most other languages. The standard library in Go is a great way to learn Go. Um, like for instance, the Ruby standard library is just like a hot mess, and like you, you really don't even understand like what's going on there. And sometimes it's not even implemented in Ruby. Uh, and you contrast it with Go, and, and Go is the standard library is extremely well written, and it's it's all in Go. Um, so it's a great resource to like have around. Like whenever you're trying to figure out like okay, like what's the best way to structure this Go code? Like more often than not, like what we say is like well, like th this idiom. Is found in the standard library, so like we use that as like arguments to how we should structure our code. We're like, well, like this is how the standard library does it, so like let's adopt that convention and do it in our in our program. Yes. Have you guys given any thought to running BTCD as opposed to Bitcoin D? That's a great question. Um, it's something that like it's come up every now and then, and there's even a few other like uh, implementations out there of, of Bitcoin nodes that people have like asked us to run, and. Our, 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 our stance to date has been, well, like, 
there's a lot of history and a lot of knowledge in Bitcoin D, and we're not convinced that other implementations have brought over that knowledge. Um, and so, because of basically because of us not understanding exactly how BTC differs from Bitcoin D, we've decided not to not to deal with it. Um, and there's you know there's a lot of great discussion, uh, and there's also a lot of great development, especially around lib consensus about like how we can kind of take some of these like the, this this knowledge and this history inside Bitcoin D and how we can get it into other implementations. Um, but from our perspective, like we just have a bunch of other things that we need to be doing, and so we haven't taken the time to really understand that BTC is a BTC D is a good option for us to, to run. Um, but certainly, we, we do. I, I, it's it's conceivable that we are using it in some way, right? Because these these Bitcoin nodes over here have to talk to something, right? And they could be talking to a BTC D daemon, right? We don't know. Uh, and and if, if you're writing a BTC daemon, you might be connected to one of our Bitcoin D nodes. So kind of transitively, we might be using it. You know, I, I'm not really sure. But that was kind of uh, a long way of saying, yeah, we looked at it, but not running it. Hey guys, we'll take one more question. Yes. Have you looked at supporting some of the meta protocols like Counterpart, or OmniLayer, or Open Assets? Yeah, <laughs> Jeffy, why don't you talk about Open Assets? Your head's been there sure. lately. Sure. Um, a lot of it comes back to that early customer driven development there. Um, to date, we haven't really seen a high demand for Counterparty, MasterCoin, any of these kinds of, um, any of those types of protocols. Um, we have seen, you know, when we're, we're working with, you know, Bitcoin startups to large enterprises, and we've seen the need for the issuance of assets other than Bitcoin. And, you know, so we've got our heads pretty deep in it right now in understanding how any of these protocols could, could apply. Um, I particularly like open assets or a color point implementation because it doesn't have its own currency. I think it's a lot simpler to understand and it's just less convoluted. Um, and, you know, if, I think it's really gonna come down to uh, having some real, like, large use cases that are, that are that are ready to like take a step into one of those directions. And so, you know, we've been looking at open assets a lot. We're working pretty closely with a handful of people in the, you know, in the color coin space. Through colorcoins.org, you know, they've got it. They're, they're trying to come to consensus on what their actual, uh, their actual protocol is. Um, and we, we've also seen demand in the marketplace, like yep. in the financial services marketplace, that will match. Uh, the, 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 there's problems out there that color that open assets can solve, yep. actually, and that's what gets us most excited about open assets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we're as we're getting into that protocol and understanding it, you know, it's still young, and so there's a lot of opportunity for um, pushing it forward. And so, you know, we're right now trying to decide, you know, if that's going to be one of the things we do, you know, kind of champion um, how we can contribute to the development of, of that process of that of that protocol. Cool. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate your attention. Thanks. <laughs>